one second. Yep, I can see your screen. Okay, thank you. By definition, preparation is the action or process of making ready. In the case of my study, preparation programming is positioned to make pre-K-12 principles ready for leadership in diverse populations. Our nation's history reveals a great contradiction in a democracy that promises liberty and justice for all while leveraging the man-made construct of race to ensure inequities. Therefore, a different level of preparation is required to lead in the midst of such complexity. In my work, I kept hearing stories of leaders lamenting about the lack of preparation to lead for equity. And if I heard different stories in different parts of the country, then I could isolate the problem. But that was not the case. I was exposed to a range of gaps from preparation to transfer. It was through this gap analysis that the problem was constructed. Practitioners who proclaim under preparation after exiting preparation programming. Well, Houston, we have a problem. So the purpose of the study became apparent. It was to illuminate this problem and investigate its experiential and perceptual impact. I formulated the research questions aligned to this purpose. The general question was about the how of leading for equity in a system designed for the opposite. So question A is about self-preparation or perception of efficacy to normalize equity culture. Subquestion so B is about agency in leading a resistance movement against institutional racism. Through the comprehensive literature review, I found a synthesis of solutions that I deem the pedagogy of resistance to interrupt institutional racism. In 1972, Paulo Freire laid out the blueprint for the pedagogy of the oppressed and conceptualized a problem-posing solution to pro provoke educational freedom. So I used this foundation to strategically select aligning pedagogies and theories. At its core, is Cross's cultural competence model because it is only through building competence that pedagogical proficiency can be realized. While Banks and Banks's equity pedagogy is the key to igniting action in recreating our democracy with classroom culture. Next, Lenin Associates calls us to be critical of racism, which divides us and implores us to center humanity as a leadership strategy to get to liberation. And the missing link is filled with Theo Harris's social justice pedagogy, which holds marginalizing practices responsible for causing injustices and makes dismantling these conditions central to leadership advocacy. Last, May and Finch's anchoring theory of NPT calls for coherence in pedagogical innovation or embedding in everyday practice so that resistance to oppressive dynamics is normalized, thereby institutionalizing equity and justice. As an extension of this framework, I aligned my research methods by coupling Smith's institutional ethnography with Oliver's emancipatory design. So what do these methods entail? As discourse texts and work are studied, shared patterns reveal institutional ways of being or ruling relations, which are the written and unwritten rules that govern people's thinking and actions. However, opposing patterns create tensions termed by Smith as problematics. You will see in the upcoming findings that the more problematics that exist, the greater the need for transformation.
For Oliver's emancipatory design, innovation is required. So we formed a principal learning community or a PLC where leaders evolved in their roles from participants to co-researchers, analyzers, and reporters, establishing a reciprocal process of inquiry and discovery where principals were empowered to leverage their learning during the study and beyond. The research framework followed that innovative design with the POC meeting over five sessions. Leaders engaged in reflective journaling. They use perceptual mapping and perform a QDA where we look for evidence of transfer. From meeting to meeting, there was, snowballing. There was a snowballing effect where the data set not only grew larger, but the opportunities for triangulation increased from one data point to the next. So the patterns became apparent. My goal was to obtain a diverse and dynamic group of leaders and accomplish that we did. A total of 12 started in the study. And after one leader withdrew, there were 11 for the remainder. They spanned 19 years of program completion from 2003 to 2022, representing brand new principals in their first years to those in the principalship for more than 10. They live and work across the country and lead in elementary schools through high schools found across different settings. They also experience a range of institutional and program types and represent identity diversity to the fullest. From the very first meeting, a surprising theme revealed itself. While just introducing the research questions to principals, a pattern arose in their responses as they shared a range of barriers to equity leadership. Amongst these barriers, they stated the charge to protect students and staff but also find themselves in need of self-protection. But why? It was at this juncture where we began to unpack supremacy strategy, full of power moves that established limits to equity leadership. Those strategies included the use of race to arrange consequences, using newness to establish fear, isolation to prevent collective action, weaponizing of racism and whiteness with embedding that in policies and practices. Therefore, the multitude of barriers was turned by this researcher as the leadership container, which is a concrete description of the institutional tension between whiteness and white supremacy versus leading for equity and justice. The equity indicators you will see listed at the bottom of the screen map out the archetype of leadership disempowerment, where you give someone the title of leader while maintaining control on the moves they can and cannot make. This paradox compels principals to define that leadership container even further. In their community definition of whiteness, leaders emphasize the indoctrinization process that influenced belief systems regarding domination and control. For white supremacy, leaders emphasize ideology that describes the systematic effect of the idea that the white race is superior and anyone not classified as white is of it, thus dehumanized and disempowered. Remember the archetype of leadership disempowerment? No wonder every principal told different versions of the same story, which became a universal thread amongst them all. That is the expectation, written or unwritten, regardless of race, place, or time, assimilation to whiteness in allegiance to white supremacy was the expected norm. May and Finch, posited that there are always methods of either promoting or inhibiting actors' agency. In our study, principals are the actors who describe a litany of inhibitors to equity leadership. First, they describe normalized racism as a system that gets the outcomes it was intended to get. Second, they describe different consequences by race in that leaders of color are naturally expected to lead for equity if they don't go too far, 
while white leaders are positioned as allies who can move in and out of allyship should the pressure become too great. Third, the power of isolation was described again by leaders where they articulated division amongst the people and the places in which they lead and singularity in their actions to end marginalization. Fourth, isolation in a centuries old system produces gaps in scalability and sustainability of, of equitable practices. Therefore, outcomes are reflective of those gaps with successes only occurring on a small scale. So question A, focus upon efficacy in transfer for normalizing equity culture and the historical role of race and isolation permeated responses. I've seen leaders rate themselves higher in DEJ readiness than those around them. The results for principals in this study were the same, but it wasn't until this study that I pinpointed the why behind the pattern. I discovered that leaders had engaged in self-study because they can control for self and grow at accelerated rates. The heaviest lift, however, is accelerating the critical mass in a system designed for delay. So this researcher used the term systems lag to describe this power-laden phenomenon impacting principal perceptions of their power to provoke system change. Cross states that it is essential to evaluate the health of systems. So the left side of the continuum represents that which is unhealthy and the right that which is healthy. The data shows that principles orient themselves on the healthy side of the continuum, mostly seeing themselves as competent and proficient. As far as those in their sphere of influence, two instances show up in competence but they are the exceptions as the majority lie in pre-competence and move backwards to destructiveness. The system was examined at two levels, district and state, where you can observe zero instances of competence or proficiency at state levels. And again, the pattern of majority in pre-competence backwards to destructiveness arises. System assimilation is apparent in that the outcomes between the sphere and the system are consistent, which was our first documented example of systems lag. According to May and Finch, there is a process by which routines become embedded, and there are four pillars. The first, cognitive participation, where there is consistency in thinking about an innovation. The second is collective action to practice the innovation. The third is coherence, where there is routine embedding that normalizes the innovation. And fourth, reflexive monitoring for sustaining innovation and continuous improvement. Again, the pattern of isolation of implementation continues with principles rating themselves on the right in the coherence and reflexive monitoring zones, while the sphere and the system lag in cognitive participation. So what does this mean? Where there is cognitive dissonance, competence is not established. Where there is no competence, there is no cognitive participation. And where cognitive participation is the dwelling place, collective action to coherence will never occur. Therefore, normalized racism thrives in lieu of equity and justice. The impact in the field is clear as we backwards mapped those results to programmatic perceptions by first analyzing instructional experiences. It is important to remember the more problematics that are apparent, the greater the need for transformation. And as for instruction in the cases of our principles, the pedagogy of the oppressed is clear. As leaders described information overload from a technical transactional standpoint, rather than that which was adaptive. They describe low to no access to diverse perspectives, limited curricula, and describe students as passive partakers of information, while robust equity dialogue application and problem solving for innovation went missing. 
When asked to evaluate the EJ alignment of their programs, the timeline is important because those who reported no alignment completed their programs between 2003 to 2018, those partial from 2011 to 2020, and those complete 2019 to 2022. At first glance, it could appear that the timeline indicates DEJ advancement. However, we found that a key component in alignment evaluation criteria was missing. In order to declare complete alignment, both knowledge application and knowledge building of DEJ principles must be intact. In the case of every single leader, they reported implementation gaps, which will be illuminated further in the findings. Furthermore, when DEJ is isolated to knowledge building within course coverage, transfer gaps will remain. So the slow pace of programmatic change is not quick enough to be responsive to the needs of a rapidly changing population. A quick triangulation, instructional gaps are consistent with preparation gaps that lead to transfer gaps that ultimately contribute to gaps in student achievement. This data comparison reveals that a P20 issue is at hand. In sub-question B, there is an emphasis on preparation and agency to re resist notions of institutional racism. To get to agency, alignment is critical and includes knowledge building and implementation. Therefore, I designed an instrument for this study called the Triple P Index to measure both. The data revealed a consensus of glass ceilings and barriers to both. Pilot studies were commensurate with research outcomes in that most responses were placed in quadrants one and three. The vertical continuum represents pedagogical knowledge and is anchored by the theoretical framework. At the bottom is the foundation of cultural competence that shifts in complexity through pedagogical synthesis and normalization. The horizontal continuum represents implementation practices and begins at low to no awareness and continues through to embedding in certification and evaluation processes. The glass ceiling becomes apparent at equity pedagogy because as pedagogical complexity increases beyond it, going up the knowledge continuum, the more likely principles responded in low to no awareness. Then another barrier becomes apparent that where awareness exists and knowledge building occurs, responses diminish again when even applying within a course or pre-service context. Responses rarely occurred in quadrants two and four, which represent the highest levels of knowledge, implementation, and complexity to normalization. This data reveals significant gaps in both knowledge building and skills implementation. Last in the investigation was the qualitative document analysis process. I created the continuum on the left in 2021 when I noticed educators conflating equity with equality, but they could readily distinguish racism from anti-racism. Each have been strategically connected to their creation or elimination of inequities termed DDP, disparities, disproportionalities, and predictability. To measure transfer to everyday work, we examined three texts, vision, mission, grading, discipline policies, and school or district improvement plans. The data reveals another interesting trend where vision, mission, and policies are primarily situated in equality. However, the QDA yielded the most contradicting data points where vision should guide policy development to inform planning. There are plans that are oriented in equity without alignment to policy or vision. Then there are instances of visions and missions oriented in equity and anti-racism with policies that lag and even fall backwards into being drivers of racism. So in summation, another triangulation, pedagogical knowledge gaps lead to skill gaps that contribute to implementation gaps that ultimately impede consistency in transfer. 
After engaging in individual reflection, leaders were asked to provide three recommendations for programmatic innovation. And interestingly, a pattern was illuminated across their responses that ultimately became what this researcher calls the justice-centered change model. Those recommendations include instructor diversity, equity integration, curriculum redesign, and strategies for recruitment, retention, and building networks of support. The last session focused upon goal setting, where principals discussed their leadership plans to transfer their learning to practice beyond the study. Those goals included comprehensive evaluation of school improvement plans, continuing their personal growth in cultural competence while increasing that of staff. They also included rewrites to visions and missions and investigations of barriers to the realization of equity and justice. Last, they committed to working that normalization process for reshaping school culture for a true anti-oppressive education. In conclusion, I am issuing an urgent call to action in that we must interrogate a tension field and gap laden system that has historically declared inequitable schooling good. But I contend that principals continue to be one of the most impactful actors that have the potential to lead a liberation movement. There is an acknowledgement that the impact of racism is ever present. But when collective pedagogical capacity building is done well in programming, it will serve as a launching pad for equity-centered agency across all levels of the system. I also contend that without agency, the institutional culture of racism, inequity, and injustice will stand and support the pervasiveness of DDP. But in the process of closing systemic gaps, we are better prepared to take collective action to eliminate inequities, bringing us closer to the realization of an actual education for the public good. So what are the implications? Deeper levels of institutional interrogation regarding intentions for educational and social change with a series of focused interrogation cycles from a P20 perspective. Two, development of pedagogical knowledge with the potential of the triple PI index used as a toolkit to guide programmatic redesign and leveraged also for PD, coaching, and mentoring. De deconstruct the change and implementation process with MPT for deeper levels of knowledge building and strategic change leadership. Conduct better evaluation of programmatic experiences that are not conflated with generalized course or program surveys, but triangulating that data with qualitative narratives of lived experiences. Institutional priorities should be reset and the justice city change model created by the principals in this study is recommended to facilitate program reviews and support alignment of priorities. Recommendations for further research, this same study should be conducted with a range of educational practi practitioners and also across other contexts. Case studies to document the growth continuum from coursework to pre and in-service practice. Longitudinal studies of some who experienced DEJ focused program versus those who did not and map capacity to reduce and eliminate DDP in the field backwards mapping studies from licensure certification exams and evaluation processes to in-service progress and programmatic requirements to ensure alignment. And last, another, tenure studies to examine effective instructional execution against student preparedness for attainment of tenure rather than limiting to research and publication. Thank you for hearing my body of research. I am welcoming any questions. All right, thank you, Tamika. All right, any questions from the committee? So Tamika, you're probably expecting this because we talked about it, but um, tell me your journey through the methodology, the emancipatory research design. I mean, this is a, well, new to, I would say, new to Notre Dame um, methodology. So tell us your two big takeaways. 
My two big takeaways um, from emancipatory research, first, when I learned the origin um, of special education and understanding the oppression and marginalization that traditionally occurs at times in, uh, in those, those processes, but then also in research. Um, I'm thinking to myself, there's no way that I can talk about equity and then not do equitable research. So for me, one of the biggest takeaways is to look at how we re redesign research processes to better match when we talk about protecting uh, those who we are uh, researching or the community communities in which we're researching. If, if the research is in, inequitable, then how is that protection? So that's one of the biggest takeaways the, that I have from this process. Uh, the second one is the engagement of the community. So when I look at um, uh, practitioners that are not being subjugated, but then emancipated as co-researchers in a process, um, it's a powerful thing. And I think that's the reason we came out with so many powerful outcomes is because of the actual study design. I don't know if I would have come or reached the same conclusions if I had not employed this design. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I have a question. Um, Tamika, I just wanted you to share with others um, a little more about your data collection, specifically um, the tool that you created and how were you able to um, get your participants to grasp your concept? Tell us a little bit about how that was for you. Okay, so the first thing um, in the creation of the tool, I, I went to the theory. So when I started to think about this and I noticed the gaps in the literature because the literature talked to me about knowledge and implementation gaps. So I started to try to figure out, well, how can we measure both? Because sometimes in academia, we develop high knowledge and not necessarily give all the skills that it needs to apply that high level of knowledge. So that's when I started thinking, well, what can I do? Um, when I started thinking the theoretical framework is what led me to establish that knowledge continuum. And then when I started to think about, okay, to what degree should we be making these implementation moves? That's when I said, okay, let me figure out what I can put on that horizontal continuum in terms of implementation that's, again, equitable, but emancipatory at the same time. If we're thinking about that embedding, that's what helped me to create the tool. Now, previously, um, the, here's the, the deal with the dots. Um, I, in my work as a professional developer, um, I've used dots before to gather data from participants on where they believe they are or how their experiences have been. So that's what led me to use the dots in order to depict that. And I felt like if you got a comprehensive picture that was a snapshot, that visual snapshot would have impact. Now, how did I get my, um, my participants to get into this tool? It was pretty easy. Um, I was hoping it would be easy, but didn't know. Um, but when I talked to them through, uh, when I talked through the, the theoretical process and they had a reference document um, that they were referring to as a scaffold. So using that scaffold was helpful because when they looked at it, they were like, okay, let me think about this. Did I hear this? Did I see this in my programming or not? Did I have this opportunity to practice my knowledge if I got it or not? And that's what helped them to place those dots pretty strategically easily for us to be able to capture that data and then be able to turn around and analyze it. Thank you, very well stated. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Garrett Way. All right, so Tamika, we all know how ambitious you are. What are your next steps? Like, how are you going to get the word out about what you've done. It can't stop here. 
Yeah, so I, first of all, I do want to um, connect in higher education. Um, after all, this PhD is higher education for changing populations, right? Higher education leadership. I do want to enter um, academia because I am usually working in pre-K-12 kind of settings, but you already, I hope, saw in the implications that I said that there were P-20 uh, kind of, of, of consequences here that we need to research. So I really am thinking around how do we connect this as an educational transformation movement where we are really focusing in on the itty bitties as I call them all the way up through collegiate education. So that really is my goal and mission uh, now. Um, I also want to hopefully um, share my research with others. So if there are opportunities for me apply, to apply, like to speak at conferences or to give lectures, um, I hope that the word gets out in that way as well. But then I hope to keep writing. So I want to um, make sure that I keep writing, not just articles, but I, I really dream to write a book uh, about this, not just this process, um, but the process of transforming education. So that's what my dreams are, hopes are, work will be. Thank you. All right, any other questions from the committee? 